Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this session we're going to introduce you to the idea of using functions in SQL Server. What we'll cover in this session is how to use functions in queries to create new calculated columns. We'll show you how you can find a list of the available functions, how to understand parameters, i.e. the bits of information that a function requires to work, how you can get extra help on functions using the built-in help in SQL Server, and finally a couple of more advanced techniques using nested functions. So let's get started. To access the full power of the types of calculations you can create in SQL Server queries, you really need to start looking into using functions. Now each database comes along with its own set of built-in system functions. They're a little bit tricky to find, but if I can lead you down the path of where to go, to get to them. Here we've got the movies database in the object explorer window. If I expand that database first, I'll find inside there a folder called programmability. I can expand that folder. Within there I'll find a folder called functions. Within there I'll find a folder called system functions. And finally, at this stage, we've got a list of the folders of different function categories. So for instance, if I wanted to find uh, some fairly familiar functions, nearly everybody's familiar with the aggregate functions. You'll be familiar with things like sum and hopefully average, min and max perhaps. These things exist in Excel and Microsoft Access. We've also got a category of date and time functions. Uh, some of those you might recognize. Uh, text functions are contained in the string functions folder. And a huge, huge variety of other functions are available. Now this list of functions isn't just useful because it shows you a list of, of function names, the ones that you can use. You can also get much more information about each function. I'm going to pick an example using one of the string functions. It's quite a simple one. But if I drill down into the string functions folder, as I hover the mouse over each function name, it's going to give me a bit of information about what the job of each function does. So the, the one I'm going to pick is called upper and it tells me that it returns a character expression with all the lowercase characters converted to uppercase. It's a very simple function. But if I want to find out even more information about what the, uh, what the function does, I can expand the function folder. In there I'll find a folder called parameters. Parameters are all the bits of information that the function requires. If I drill down into that folder, I'll see at this point two bits of information for this particular function. The items with an at symbol are all the parameters. These are all the things that the function must be provided with in order to work. So I have to provide some kind of expression which contains either varchar or nvarchar, so any kind of text data, basically. The last item in this list here shows me that the function returns also varchar or nvarchar data. So if I can use this information, what I ought to be able to do is create a new column in my select list using the upper function. You can always tell when you've referred to a built-in function because it will turn this sort of magenta, pink, purple color. After the name of a function, you always need to open a set of parentheses or round brackets. And into that function, I'm gonna pass in my film name. That's the single argument or the single parameter that this function needs in order to work. So all I need to do now is close the round brackets and that function's complete. If I execute my query, we can see it does exactly the job that it says it would. So it converts all lowercase characters into all uppercase characters. So there's an example of a simple function. Now although the Object Explorer can show you a lot of information about each function, it doesn't always show you everything that you need to know. To demonstrate this, I'm going to work with another function. I'm going to try to calculate the month that a film was released in. So I want to see the name of each month that a film was released in. To do that, I'm going to use one of the date and time functions. So I'm going to find the date and time functions category and look for the date name function. If I hover the mouse, it tells me it returns a character string representing the specified part of a date. So I'm going to use this function. I'm going to first of all find out what parameters it requires. If I expand the parameters folder, I see there are two parameters. One's called date part and the other's called expression. So using that information, I should be able to start creating my calculation by typing in date name. And I can see it appears in the list and it turns magenta when I've typed in his name properly. And then when I open the round brackets, 
I have to provide the interval, the, the portion of time that I'm interested in returning. Now at this point I'm a bit stuck because I don't know what my valid options are. So I'm going to click onto the date name function and press the F1 key on the keyboard. This is a, a reasonably reliable way to get help on a specific function or keyword. Although in this case it's, uh, it's, it's fallen over a little bit. It's returned information on the date parts function rather than date name which is what I asked for. That's not a big issue. You can always filter your list by typing into the search box once the, uh, once the help system has appeared and you can see now that the date name function has appeared in the, in the list. If I click on that I'll get information on the function that I really wanted which is date name. Now the, uh, the syntax of the function is shown towards the top of the page. If I scroll down it will list out for me each of the arguments or each of the parameters. So date part, now it lists for me all of the valid options that I'm allowed to use. So I can either use the word month or one of two abbreviations, either MM or M. Well, I'm quite lazy when it gets down to things like this, so I'm going to use the shortest, shortest option possible. I'm going to go for M. If I type in a comma then, I know that the next argument requires some kind of date time information and that must be the date that I'm looking to return the month from. So I can just do a quick copy and paste there. Close around brackets. And when I execute my query, I should see that I get the names of each month. So there you go, there's another useful function that you can find information on using both the Object Explorer and when that fails, you can click on the name of a function and press F1 to try to get help on it. One more thing worth understanding about functions is that you're not limited to using one function per calculation. You can also nest functions together to create more elaborate type calculations. So as one more example, we're going to calculate how old our films are in days. To do that we're going to combine the date diff function, which you'll find in the date and time functions folder, uh, we're going to combine date diff with get date. Date diff calculates the difference between two dates. Get date calculates whatever today's date is based on your system clock. So to start with, I'm going to find out what functions date diff requires, what arguments or parameters date diff requires. And I can see that it requires three date part, starting date, and ending date. Date part is very similar to what we saw with date name here. So I'm going to add in the date diff function to a new expression and the interval I'm interested in this time uh, I know is days, I can either type in day or two d's or because I'm quite lazy when it comes to things like this I can get away with a single d. Then a comma. That will tell me that the next argument is the starting date and the starting date is whatever the film release date was, that's the earliest date in the two that I'm looking for. Followed by one more comma and the final thing I'm looking for it's the ending date, which must be a date time. Now I could, if I wanted to, type in a date, as in 2012, what is the date today? The date today is the 14th of May, so I can type in 2012-05-14. And that's completely acceptable. The problem is that if I come back to this calculation tomorrow, it's going to be incorrect. I'd have to modify this to the 15th, and so on. So instead I'm going to use another function to calculate what today's date is and that's the getDate function. If I look at what parameters the getDate function requires, it tells me that there are none. So that's a really, really simple, straightforward function to use. If I type in getDate, even though there are no arguments or no parameters, it still requires a set of parentheses. So I can open and close those. Close one more set of parentheses for the getDate function, and there we go. If I execute this query, it will tell me how old my films are in days. It's quite a frighteningly high number. Particularly if you remember going to see some of these films at the cinema, which I do. So that's one simple example of a nested function. There are many, many more, but that's enough to get you started with the idea. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.